I, again, I try not to overthink things. Just understand we are in a 100% certain environment where fiat will debase. You got to protect yourself against that. And that 100% certainty includes owning hard assets, which include gold, oil, real estate, and the best hard asset ever invented by man, Bitcoin. Welcome to episode two of the Block Reward podcast. Our guest today is Greg Foss. Really exciting day for me. When I first started planning the podcast, I put together my list of dream guests and uh, Greg was right at the top. So I'm thrilled that he's joined us today to share some of his ideas and opinions. Greg's somebody that I've learned a ton from, uh, both about Bitcoin, but also about traditional financial markets. He is somebody with a rich background, 30 plus years working on the debt side, um, trading bonds and credit products. And so that experience has really given him a unique way of looking at Bitcoin in terms of what Bitcoin is and what it does, but also you know, why it's relevant and, and why investors might want to consider it as an alternative to something like bonds. And so um, Greg's experience has really given him this framework for valuing Bitcoin and understanding how it might fit into the financial world of tomorrow. What I love about Greg is, you know, he's a passionate guy, but he also has a real knack for explaining complicated things, uh, really breaking it down in a way that it's super digestible. So Greg is somebody that just looks at numbers and can understand the numbers in a really, really simple way. I hope you enjoy. I hope you enjoy him as much as I do. And here we go. All right. Uh, welcome to another, another episode of The Block Reward. Um, exciting day for me today where we have Greg Foss joining us. Greg is a fellow Canadian Bitcoiner and a veteran of the capital markets. Um, big voice in the Bitcoin community and uh, thrilled, thrilled to have you here today, Greg. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Scott. Pleasure uh, to talk with you and I enjoy everything you're doing for the Canadian Bitcoin community as well. Thank you. Um, maybe just uh, as we're uh, not specifically targeting the hardcore Bitcoin audience with the block reward, uh, could you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started? A hundred percent. So I am a tried and true Canadian, fifth generation Canadian. I grew up in Montreal, but moved to Toronto after uh, uh, receiving my MBA from Cornell University in the United States. Uh, the reason I say that is because uh, while we think that the Canadian U.S. cultures are somewhat similar, you really have to live there uh, and uh, experience uh, long term. Uh, life in the United States to see some of the subtle differences between our two cultures. So grew up in Montreal, went to McGill, engineer. So mathematics is a comfortable subject with me, uh, but realized I didn't want to be an engineer. Uh, did my MBA, came back to Canada and worked on Bay Street for the better part of 30 years, um, trading credit. And I believe that credit runs the world as it does because it's the largest asset class in the world. So I believe you have to look at credit markets for all the uh, direction that they provide. And since fiat money or paper money, money that's based on trust but no intrinsic value is based on the credit system, you need to understand how the credit system works, which is to say, Credit has a prior claim on assets than equity. So if you own the equity of a company, you better understand where the credit of that company is trading because in the event that the credit is not worth 100% of parity or 100 cents on the dollar, the equity is worth zero, right? And this is the whole uh, priority of claims model within capital markets, capital structure, arbitrage. So that's where I spent my career. I started as a junk bond trader. For those Canadians that aren't aware, Ted Rogers, the famous cable and media and wireless uh, entrepreneur, was at one point, Scott, the largest high-yield borrower in the world, not just in Canada. Ted Rogers was the largest high-yield bond borrower in the world. And Canadians 
would not own the bonds because they were junk bonds, but they would own the equity of Rogers Communications because Rogers Communication equity was in the TSX 60, the top 60 companies in Canada. But they wouldn't own the bonds because the bonds are too risky. But I just walked you through a scenario that unless the bonds are worth 100% apart, the equities were zero. And I went through a career of trying to develop a high-yield bond market in Canada. Uh, to a large extent, we were successful at doing that, where Ted Rogers can now borrow most of his money in Canada rather than having to go to the United States to raise money. So it's a, I, I feel I'm living a similar challenge with Bitcoin right now, trying to educate people and investors as to the advantages of Bitcoin and why I believe Bitcoin is such an important component of a diversified investment portfolio. And, and you, you um, relatively early, you discovered Bitcoin. I think you were sort of class of 2016, something like that. You know, um, let's just say I wish I had, uh, when I first discovered it, I wish I had taken it more seriously, which was probably around 2013, to be honest. But by the time I did take it seriously in 2016 and did the appropriate deep dive, um, yes, that's when I got involved. And the price of Bitcoin was between 800 and 1,000 US dollars. And I remember pounding the table, even with Kathy Wood, who's a famous portfolio manager in Florida. Uh, she and I invested in a Bitcoin startup in the Montreal uh, area that became. Well, it was called 3IQ. It actually became a Bitcoin ETF in Canada. I remember pounding the table with Kathy Wood uh, present in the presence of some bankers and said, Bitcoin's going to $10,000. You guys just don't see it. And that was my price target, like 10000 And then I started doing more work and I'm like, whoa, no, my price target's way, way higher than 10000 But, uh, you know, you, 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 Bitcoin is a journey. It's not a destination. You go through these uh, understandings of why Bitcoin is so important, what a beautiful technology it is, why the fiat system, and that's where I come at things, why the fiat system is nothing more than an inflating credit bubble that uh, has to go on forever, which means your fiat dollar will be debased with 100% certainty. So, you know, it's a combination of different factors. 2016, I got involved. I would say over the last seven years, I continue to learn more about the beauty of Bitcoin. Um, my uh, passion for it has not decreased. Um, the reality is that Bitcoin is going to be a life changer for so many people in the world. And uh, I just, you know, Bitcoin for me is hope. Fiat and the money, or sorry, the math behind the fiat system is so discouraging that Bitcoin provides hope. Do you remember, uh, was there a moment where you first sort of, it clicked for you and you figured out, like, all of a sudden you, you had an understanding of what it did and, and what was it? Well, so I, I mentioned I'm an engineer and my aha moment was watching the Bitcoin blockchain in action. So I'd heard all this stuff, but I never actually watched the, uh, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. You could go to tradeblock.com. You can watch it in many different formats. You can watch the transactions, uh, the mem pool. You can see the uh, value of the transactions taking place. You know, you'll see hundreds of dollars, then you'll see thousands of dollars, then you'll see a couple of million of dollars. And then you'll be like, and no one's controlling this. This is a decentralized platform of transferring value over time and space. Like it's absolutely beautiful. And um, I would just say that the aha moment for me as an engineer, I'm a mechanical engineer. So I like to see things in motion, you know, I saw this thing in motion and I'm like, I looked at the guy and I'm like, oh my God, this actually is the solution to the Fiat Ponzi that I've been looking for my whole life. Cool. 
Yeah, it's funny. I was at a, w- a wedding on the weekend, and uh... oh, I saw that. Yeah, you had a you had yeah. some <laughs> some drunken fiat bro that was uh, telling you how Bitcoin was, uh, you know, the Ponzi. Well, you know what? Everybody has to learn it their own way. I it's not like I want. Well, let's go ahead with your story, and then I'll I'll finish my story. Yeah, no, the it was just like. <clears throat> You know, people who haven't seen that stuff, the meme poll is such a great example because it's like to outsiders, they think that the white paper was written yesterday. And, you know, the Bitcoin network's already moved well over $100 trillion without any, um, you know, traditional financial institution involved. Isn't that, isn't that, a, that's a great number. You know what? I, I, you're the first one to quote that number. I'm sure it's quoted in a number of places, but for me, that's a, that's an eye opening number. It's, uh, you know, that is transfer of value over time and space in real measurable uh, units. And, uh, you know, I don't particularly like the unit uh, of measuring Bitcoin in fiat dollars, but fiat dollars for now or U.S. dollars is the measuring stick. And that measuring stick tends to change uh, based on uh, monetary policy. But uh, let's just say that uh, that's a cool number. Totally. How how was uh how was your your background with credit and bonds helpful for you then? Once once it sort of clicked for you, this thing's legit. You know, I, I find that people as they as they learn more about Bitcoin, everyone brings with them their personal experience and background. So there, you want to then relate it to things that you you have expertise on, and you you have this really specific expertise. And so my uh, my thesis, and I wrote a paper on this. It's sudden. It's somewhat what vaulted me into let's call it Twitter fame or uh, is that Bitcoin is, can actually be valued using credit default swaps on sovereign debt. Now, I don't want to get too granular with people, but having spent my life in credit and focusing on the fact that I believe credit runs the world, which I'm afraid to tell you it does, okay? You can disagree with me, but you're going to be wrong. Credit runs the world. You can value Bitcoin as being credit insurance on the fiat system. And there's actually a mechanism to value that. And one of my friends at Swan Bitcoin has created uh, that valuation tool in real time under the portfolio nakamotoportfolio.com, which is a Swan Bitcoin product. You can go to that web page and you can calculate in real time the value of bitcoin uh using credit default swaps on sovereign debt and that was the th- my thesis i believe that bitcoin should be trading far higher than it currently is but i'm okay with the fact that it isn't because not everybody has to agree in the different analytical tools my tool is just one of many that are out there. Uh, But to me, it's my bread and butter because having spent, having lived through the great financial crisis, I've lived through four financial crises in my career. I got my start in 1986 at the Royal Bank, excuse me, 1988 at the Royal Bank of Canada working for the CFO on the Latin American debt problem that the world had, but so did the Royal Bank. And my job was to price the Latin American debt portfolio of the Royal Bank of Canada. And here's a side story that it's somewhat concerning, but was true 30 years ago. I was working for the CFO. I did a quick back of the envelope calculation. If we had marked the Latin American debt portfolio to market, which is to say marked down the price of the loans to the trading price they were trading at, the haircut you would have to take would have wiped out the book value of equity of the Royal Bank of Canada, which is to say the Royal Bank of Canada was insolvent in 1988. So that's a little scary, but this actually happens on a fairly regular basis with commercial banking. It wasn't the Royal Bank of Canada being insolvent that concerned the world. It was the fact that all money center banks in the United States were in exactly the same position. And that's why Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady in the 19, late 1980s had to devise a plan called the Brady Plan to, to rescue the 
commercial banking system for the world. And that was my first financial crisis, but it was really an eye opener because, you know, I'd been through six years of school to graduate and come back to Canada to work for Canada's financial, largest financial institution. And I said to the CFO, Emil, we have a problem. And he said, I know, don't tell anybody. Okay, hold on a second. I'm a 27 year old kid. And Canada's largest financial institution is insolvent. And I'm not going to run out and tell anybody, but I'm like, how come more people don't understand how this works? And what happens is you get jaded because it went from 1988 to 1998, which is long-term capital management, which was another financial crisis that basically Wall Street was insolvent because of the shenanigans of a highly levered hedge fund in the U.S., excuse me, called long-term capital management. Then 2008, 2009, man, that was really, really scary. That was the great financial crisis. And then uh, the COVID crisis. So all of these crises have similar things, and that's that leverage in the financial system comes home to roost and the equity, there's no equity left. Remember, the credit was impaired. So when the credit is impaired, there's nothing left for the equity. Okay? So just that's how I look at life through the uh, credit lens. And um, that's why I wrote the paper. And again, it's just a model, but it's the model that I believe carries a lot of weight in the credit community. You, uh, <clears throat> you did a great podcast with uh, Safe and Ian recently, and the, the title of that episode was called Bond Apocalypse. Okay. What, what, I, are, they, <laughs> what are the risks that, that bonds are facing today, and, and how does Bitcoin present an alternative for bond investors? Well, let's understand what a bond is to begin with. It's nothing more than a fiat contract, right? It's a promise to pay a series of coupons or interest payments over time together with a principal repayment, which rewards the lender for the risk that they are taking in lending that money. Now, in the event that the only thing you have to price in there is a credit concern coupled with an inflation concern, it's a fairly easy model to try and put a coupon on the bonds. The problem arises when you realize that the fiat contract in which it's denominated is programmed to debase because total global debt is such a large entity that the only way total global debt can remain is if they keep printing money to pay for the total global debt. Another way of saying that is we are in a global debt spiral because we have pulled forward gains at the expense of our children uh, living on money that the only way that it can be paid back is if they, pay, if they print more money. That's scary, isn't it, Scott? Because that means that the money will be debased. So let's take the United States government right now. T 10 years, you'll get a coupon return of 4.25% over a 10-year period. You're highly likely, but not certain. And when I say not certain, that's one of the reasons that there's a credit default swap market on the United States of America. You're highly confident, but not certain. You will get your 4.25% coupon paid semi-annually over a period of 10 years and get your principal return. The $100 that you lend at time zero will get returned. The problem, what is that $100 worth in 10 years time? Nowhere near what it was worth at time zero. And that is the certainty of fiat debasement, basically making bonds a suspect return. 
And that's why I believe that every single portfolio in the world that has an exposure to bonds actually needs an exposure to Bitcoin as well to hedge that fiat debasement, the certainty of that fiat debasement. And so for the people who are still, you know, think that Bitcoin is, uh, isn't backed by anything or doesn't have any intrinsic value, you know, what, what is that mechanism just because it's a, you know, ask you a dumb question. It's, is it because it's going to be a good performing asset or? Yes. Or it's like an insurance policy, right? Um, you own fire insurance on your house and you know that it's been a hot, dry summer and you can actually see fire in the distance. Well, we'll draw the parallel with fiat. There's going to be another credit event coming. They always come. The reality is it's kicking the can down the road, but the mathematics, which make it a certainty, require you to own this insurance on the fiat system. And you can calculate the value of fire insurance. Now, that value actually increases as the fire approaches your house, right? I mean, you're not going to go out and sell your fire insurance as the fire is getting closer. Uh, in fact, you're very happy that you purchased it at a cheaper price. Same thing happens in credit default swap markets and the calculation and the risk return components. My point is that you buy fire insurance when it's cheap and you hold it as insurance over time. And what is the value? The value could actually be measured in real units, but it's also the value of peace of mind. It's the value of having a portfolio protection. And so, again, as I said, you can go and calculate the actual intrinsic value of that portfolio protection using credit default swaps. It may not be the number that, that resonates with you, but unfortunately, you're going to have to accept it as an input value because I'm using real open market rates to calculate this value. I can get to other valuation metrics for Bitcoin, and it's all part of formulating a hypothesis of where the price of Bitcoin should go. But uh, at this point, the intrinsic value of Bitcoin, excuse me, in my opinion, I just had a root beer. I, I went for a paddleboard this morning. So I'm, I'm, I, I drank a root beer, which is not the proper thing to do before a podcast. But um, you need to understand that that intrinsic value is at least a measurement. It's one of the measurements that go into providing value for Bitcoin. What is the intrinsic value of fiat? Well, it's actually negative because fiat is debt. It's a liability. It's not an asset. Think about that for a sec. And, you know, that's where people, perhaps you're, you're, you, you didn't talk about that uh, event at the uh, at the um, wedding, I saw you you tweet out that. But sometimes the best way to convince people they need Bitcoin is to teach them how the fiat system actually works. And maybe they open their eyes and say, like I did. My experience was, guard darn it, I started working in the fiat system in 1988, and Canada's largest financial institution is insolvent. What's the solution? Well, I didn't become a gold bug. I just knew that the fiat system was, wow, this is pretty scary. And uh, that is the same th way as saying, you got to do your own homework on the fiat system and realize why you need hard assets as protection against the fiat system. It's a continually amazing thing for me to see how many people that know a lot about financial products, um, it, it just kind of escapes people the absurdity of that we have this built-in mechanism that demands our money becomes worth less continuously yes. forever. 
Well, that's the, that's the reality. That's like I say, the mathematics of it. It's only mathematics. So uh, it, obviously we're in 2023 now and Bitcoin blasted past 10,000, way past it in the last run. And um, I'm, I'm going to guess, you, obviously you still think Bitcoin, Bitcoin today is cheap and uh, it's going to be cheap for a while. I may well be. Uh, there are events that could, in fact, uh, make it become less cheap. Uh, ultimately, it's a supply and demand product. Um, something like a Bitcoin ETF in the United States could cause the price to rise. Um, likely, in my opinion, will cause the price to rise. But I, I, I tend to try and simplify things. So I have this valuation using open market credit default swaps, which I can easily get to a valuation on Bitcoin over 10 times as high as it is right now. So at 25,000, I can easily show you why it should be trading at 250,000, okay? Just using open market credit default swaps. But here's an even more simple potential valuation for Bitcoin. The total global financial assets in the world today are 900 trillion US dollars. That includes 400 trillion of debt at the top of the capital stack, okay? 400 trillion US dollars of debt. There's 300 trillion of equity. There's 100 trillion, excuse me, 300 trillion of real estate, okay? So 400, 300 trillion of real estate, 100 trillion of equity, and then 100 trillion of other assets, including gold, fine art, currencies, commodities, so you got 400, 300, 100, 100. That's a total of 900 trillion US dollars, okay? I'm going to test your mathematics, Scott. You can have a calculator next to you <laughs> if you want. But what if Bitcoin was to grab 5% of that 900 trillion dollars? What is 5% of 900 trillion? So 45 trillion. Atta boy. That's good. Have you heard me say this before? And say, no, I haven't. I just no, did that no. math in my head. <laughs> okay, 45 trillion. Take 45 trillion and divide it by 21 million Bitcoin. And you get a price of over 2 million US dollars per Bitcoin in today's dollars. That is key, in today's dollars. So Bitcoin trades for less, trades for $25,000. And I can show you a valuation model where it goes up uh, almost 100 times. Am I certain it's going to happen? No. But I'm higher than 0% chance it's going to happen. Okay? There is that chance. And for that reason, I believe Bitcoin could be one of the best asymmetric investment opportunities I've ever seen. And everybody needs some exposure to Bitcoin. The flip side of saying that is if my price target say two and a half million dollars and Bitcoin's trading at $25,000, the market is only telling me I have a 1% chance of being right, right? 25,000 divided by two and a half million is one in 100 or 1%. Again, I'm not 100% certain I'm going to be correct with my Bitcoin price target, but I'm far higher, higher than, 1. than 1%. Okay, so that's how I always do probability analysis and uh, investment thesis. It's how I've managed risk during my career. Um, that's basically it in a nutshell. I believe Bitcoin is a beautiful insurance policy on the fiat system. I'm concerned with the fiat system. I believe the fiat system causes a lot of problems. Bitcoin solves many of these problems. And for that reason, I believe everybody should own more than zero. The only wrong allocation to Bitcoin is a 0% allocation. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned the ETFs, and we have a bunch of... Uh spot price Bitcoin ETFs in Canada already. So I, I, I feel sometimes like Canadians maybe don't, uh, it's, it's not, um, 
it's just not as big of a, a wow news thing without people really thinking about what gold ETFs did to the gold Correct. price. Right. So, yeah, let me, let's talk a little bit about BlackRock. And, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think the if, if BlackRock, uh, world's largest asset manager, is successful in getting their U.S. spot price Bitcoin ETF approved, and it's probably sometime between now and March, uh, what does that mean? Well, I believe it's positive for capital markets and free markets for people who want exposure to various uh, risk mitigating strategies, which I, I've tried to indicate that's what I think Bitcoin is actually a risk mitigator. Um, that's positive. And as a supply and demand asset with fixed supply, meaning there's only going to ever be 21 million Bitcoin, uh, I believe that the price goes higher. But I try not to overthink things. Um, you know, it's a journey, not a destination. The price may go higher, but it doesn't mean that I want to sell it because it still is your insurance and you can see the fire on the horizon and you want to own that insurance in the event of an ap uh, apocalypse. You could say Fadine called it the bond apocalypse. Uh, you know, that could happen. It happens in third world countries all the time. And you're going to say, oh, don't worry. The USA is not a third world country. True. But the USA has a third world balance sheet. Ooh -ooh. Okay. Sometimes people realize just because you're the global reserve currency, maybe I don't want to hold your global reserve asset, which is U.S. Treasury bonds, as sometime they may not be worth 100 cents on the dollar. That's simple, sir. If you can see the fire in the horizon, you need to plan accordingly. Uh North, you know, this, this is, uh, we're recording this in Canada and, um, we're, we're, we're in a little bit of a stickier spot than the U S. Um, so it, it's September 6th today and the bank of Canada just announced a no change today, but, you know, we're sort of painted into this corner with where we can either keep raising along with the U S or we can devalue the Canadian dollar. Correct. However, in both cases, it's still a debt spiral where we've borrowed too much money. It's irrelevant, almost what the interest rates are right now, because the total debt burden is so high that you'll need to continue to print money to pay that debt burden. So, I, again, I try not to overthink things. Just understand we are in a 100% certain environment where fiat will debase. You got to protect yourself against that 100% certainty. And that 100% certainty includes owning hard assets, which include gold, oil, real estate, and the best hard asset ever invented by man, Bitcoin. Uh, maybe we'll just take a, take a little detour from Bitcoin for a second. And uh, can I ask you about your thoughts on Canadian real estate? Sure. Having not being an expert in any way, uh, I can feel for my kids about how you wonder if you'll ever be able to afford a house. And the reality is, yes, the house prices have skyrocketed, but why have they skyrocketed? It's not that the value of the house has changed that much. It's the unit of account, which is the fiat dollar, has gone down. The measuring stick has changed. So if you're asking me whether I think there'll be a housing crisis, there could be. But over time, I believe real estate will continue to go higher simply because the fiat currency will continue to go lower. So, so as a, in terms of like, a, a, I guess, uh, a hierarchy of how these things could be viewed to perform, um, a lot of the people who look at, you know, maybe this idea of Bitcoin as insurance is, you know, there, there can be an expansion of there will always be building more houses. There's always going to be more mining of more gold. And Bitcoin is this one thing that uh, over 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, yeah. 80 years, 
They just can never speed up how much they're making and they can never make any more of it. Absolutely correct, sir. It's a funny thing how like, um, I had somebody else tell me the other day, like Bitcoin has some nice features. Uh, uh, this concept of absolute scarcity, it's, it's so foreign that people really, it, it's, it seems to be very difficult for people to appreciate exactly what a big deal it is. It's a one-time invention of absolute scarcity. Couldn't say it any better myself. Yeah. And so to your point about 900 trillion, I mean, it's, it's 900 trillion today, but it'll be a, a quadrillion and then 1.2 yes, and 1.4. But, but, but remember, I gave you my price target on Bitcoin in today's dollars. You can right. do your own math. Do 1%, do 5%, which is 45 trillion, do 10%. All of a sudden, my price target's not two and a half million. It's actually 5 million. Now, these numbers are so astronomical that I throw it out and only say, okay, come on, guys, play a game. What if there was a 3% chance it went to $5 million? And a 97% chance it went to zero, Scott. I'm going to test your math again. What should the price of Bitcoin be in that binary scenario where there's a 3% chance it goes to... To 5 million? 5 million and a 97% chance it goes to zero. What's the expected value of Bitcoin in that scenario? Only uh, two outcomes. 150,000? a boy. How about that, kid? This, is, this was not rehearsed. <laughs> that was not rehearsed because I've never done this one before. So that's to say that if you have a 3% confidence that Bitcoin goes to 5 million and it's currently trading at 25,000, which is one eighth of 150,000. Is it one eighth? No, uh, it's one, one sixth. Bitcoin's trading for one sixth of the amount of your binary outcome scenario. Yeah. Damn, it looks cheap to me. Yeah, 600 fold return, so pretty good hey. under any time frame. Under any time frame, but more importantly, what if your confidence level was not just 3%, which w what if it was, I don't know, 10%? Damn. This is how you do these probability scenarios. So, uh, you know, we, we can converge on this interest of, um, you know, I found it initially because I, I became interested in Bitcoin when I started learning about um, the risks facing bonds and the amount of bonds held by pensions. And um, we've talked about this in different conversations, but like, how do you see Bitcoin becoming, um, you know, an, an asset that pensions in Canada start to consider? Sort of like the high yield bond journey that I was on. When I started, there was only one account in Canada that was buying new issue high yield debt from Canadian companies or U.S. companies for that matter. Only one account. And it was an account based out in Vancouver called Dean's Knight Capital Management. Doug Knight remains one of my close friends. Dougie was a, a trailblazer in the credit markets in Canada. As I mentioned, most other Canadians would not buy the bonds of Rogers Communications, but they'd buy the equity because the index had the equity in it. Crazy as that sounds. Uh, 30 years later, just about every pension plan in Canada has exposure to high yield bonds. Okay. What happens with Bitcoin? Well, with new uh, bridges for adoption, like the Bitcoin ETFs that will be approved in the United States that we already have in Canada, I believe more and more clients will have exposure to Bitcoin. Something greater than zero, something less than 2% to start. But again, if you run 2% of 900 trillion, 2% of 900 trillion is 18 trillion. 18 trillion divided by 21 million? Ah, you're close enough to a million dollars of Bitcoin that I don't think you should overthink stuff. Looks a little cheap to me. Yep, yep. 
Yeah, it's uh, it's an amazing uh, asymmetric opportunity. I think like no matter how you slice it, but I've always appreciated uh, you have you have a few different ways to look at it. And um, in spite of all that, it's amazing to me again how how reluctant people are. And I think it comes back to that. You know, nobody, almost nobody realizes that hundreds of trillions have moved or over a hundred trillion has moved on this network already. Like this thing is a fully functioning product that can do. Oh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful living, breathing organism that uh, is not, does not have any centralized control. There's no, there's no CEO of Bitcoin. There's no head of the snake. It's, it's a beautifully decentralized uh, platform for transferring value over time and space um do, do you have a favorite uh like a personal favorite when you run into talking to people about bitcoin and they don't want to hear it like what what is the thing that that drives you the craziest i uh i try and i try and feel empathy you know they don't realize that they could be jeopardizing the future of their children um, I believe that Bitcoin promotes an egalitarian world where someone in Africa, it's not about how much money they have. It's about the opportunity to be able to buy this asset at the same price as anywhere else in the world, as at the same price as someone who's living in a more privileged uh or you know perhaps a a wall street type of position the price is agnostic whereas fiat tends to benefit the people that are closest to the money printer and bitcoin is absolutely different than that so i feel empathy i encourage people to try and do the work i would my tag tagline on Twitter, right, is for the kids. And uh, I truly believe that to be the case, Scott. Yeah, I love that about your message. And you know, you're, you're a passionate guy. So you, you've, you've taken some heat at different times for, uh, for uh, being extra passionate. But it's true. I think that um, I, I, I agree. It, it, what, what gets lost in everybody's grown up in this system of fiat money. And so the absurdity of having your purchasing power stolen uh, is just something that not, not doesn't keep up everybody at night. And um, it, it, the, the effects of how that is uh, rippling out across the world, uh, because to varying degrees, depending on where you live and the level of government corruption or ineptitude, uh, the, the, uh, this is the reason why Money is uh, this, is this weird thing where it, it's the only technology in the world that doesn't work. You can't take your Canadian dollars to any country in the world and spend it. Right. Yeah, it's uh, we can do better. Uh, we can do better for everybody. Well, you're working hard on your uh, your angles with the Pension Benefits Canada. Uh, you know, we're all we're all just trying to get up on the. Uh, up on the mountain and scream as loud as we can. Uh, there is a problem. That problem has enormous repercussions. There is a solution. It's called Bitcoin. And all we can do is try and open as many people's eyes to it as possible, which can't make them. If they refuse to understand, that's their prerogative. I would just hope that they would do the work and understand how important this is for the future, for the children of the future. Um, you, you, you do put out a lot of great stuff, Greg. Uh, like, uh, so if, if someone was looking to find more of you, it's an easy YouTube. Um, and you mentioned Nakamoto Portfolio. You've done a few great podcasts. On, is it, it's the Nakamoto Portfolio Gauntlet podcast. Is that right? That's one of them. We just did the Wisconsin Pension Plan yesterday. Cool. And I happen to be wearing the same T-shirt. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dox myself. Uh, I'm wearing the same T-shirt because, uh, as I mentioned, I went for a paddle this morning. Not in this T-shirt, but I didn't put on a clean T-shirt before our podcast. 
Because as you know, I had forgotten that we were having this podcast. And I just got back from a paddleboard when I checked your, uh, your text message. Are we still doing this? So this is my friend's Ibex Mercado. It's a group of kids who actually developed the merchant solution for uh, El Salvador for the payments using Bitcoin in El Salvador. So Ibex Mercado, shout out to the boys. They originally from Guatemala. Good South American kids developing and building a company that's going to be a world-class uh, institution. Uh, I actually was wearing this t-shirt on yesterday's Nakamoto uh, gauntlet with the pension plan from Wisconsin. Uh, but look, 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 look. Foss does shower, okay? I do actually shower. <laughs> I just didn't have time because you caught me off guard with this. Uh, I hadn't had this in my... Uh, in my uh, calendar so <laughs> <laughs> so the uh just for for listeners what greg's referring to on that on that particular podcast you take existing pension plans and model out the the optimal bitcoin allocation right and for the for the uh wisconsin pension plan the optimal allocation using back testing was six percent wow okay you wow. think they're going to get to six percent not anytime soon but that's all portfolio analytics. That's all that things come down to. So, um, yeah, it's math, guys. It's only math. I can you can measure things different ways, but that's that's what it comes down to. Cool. Well, maybe we'll wrap there, Greg. And I I just want to thank you again for coming on. I so appreciate the the work you do and your voice. I think um, you know it, for a lot of people. Um, there's such a there's such a resistance to hearing Bitcoin ideas that it's inspiring for a lot of people to see other people in their uh, you know coming forward and having courage and and just trying to get as many people to listen as possible. So I've I've always wanted to thank you for the work you do every day. Oh, man. And thank you too, Scott. You and I are in touch on different subjects and projects, and uh, you know it's it's a it's a tough journey at times, but. Uh, I believe we will be rewarded and uh, I want to thank you for everything you do as well. Right on. Well, maybe we'll do it again sometime. All right, my friend. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Block Reward. We're trying to do something different here, creating accessible conversations meant for people who aren't obsessed with Bitcoin. If you found this episode informative and engaging, hit that subscribe button to make sure you stay updated with future episodes. Your feedback matters. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could take a moment to share your reviews and help us with our goal of creating Bitcoin content that is simple and easy to understand. Bitcoin has an important role to play in the future of finance. It will change the way we save, spend, and invest. Discover why Bitcoin offers a game-changing opportunity for forward-thinking employers by visiting blockrewards.ca. BlockRewards' mission is helping Canadian employers implement strategies for integrating Bitcoin into compensation and benefits. Supercharge your recruitment and retention strategies and help your team members plan for the rising cost of living by rewarding their work with the hardest money ever invented. Special thanks to our top sponsor, Paramount Employee Benefits Consulting, Canada's only Bitcoin Forward Benefits and Pension Advisory. For more information, find them at paramountbenefits.ca. Big shout out to Podigy, our production team that makes all this possible, and BMX Escape for producing our music. Bitcoin is an expansive and dense topic many people walk away from early. To Bitcoin enthusiasts looking for that podcast they can share with friends, family, and colleagues, one they'll actually listen to, we hope that is us. The content of these conversations is meant to be provided for information purposes only. Nothing here is investment advice. Bitcoin is a big topic. Be sure to do your own research before making any personal financial decisions. Thanks for listening. 